Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Yogi Joshi from Wrexham, United Kingdom. Dr. Joshi is a consultant orthopedic surgeon based in Wrexham with a special interest and research focus on knee surgery. If you've noticed, Dr. Joshi has delivered several lectures on our channel, which have already reached to a huge audience globally. So today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Yogesh Joshi for this wonderful live program. Over to Yogesh. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gopalan. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, your channel um, is really fantastic. Um, I have viewed many of your videos um, on your channel and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today we are going to talk about ACL reconstruction. Um, this is part two of the two series of ACL reconstruction that we have done. In the first video uh, session, we talked about the ACL anatomy, um, the physiology, how it works, the mechanism of injury, uh, how we deal with um, these patients non-operatively. Uh, in this lecture, we will talk about how we deal with it surgically and uh, the various concept uh, that needs to be cleared. So we are just going through one by one. Um, the main focus would be to improve the function of the patient through surgical management. As surgeons, we want to make people better. The, the inherent complication of ACL reconstruction is, is it failure? And how to prevent failure? There are some surgical points we need to make sure that we follow so that uh, it doesn't happen. So I'm uh, Yogesh uh, Joshi. I'm one of the knee surgeons based in Raxamila Hospital. Um, it's a district general hospital in North Wales. Uh, it's a beautiful place. And if anyone wants to come and visit us, uh, you're more than welcome. Um, and um, I, I take referrals um, from all over the North Wales region. So that was our first part. We talked about anatomy, function of the ACL, injury patterns, presentations, clinical test investigations, prevention, uh, preventive strategies for ACL injuries, conservative management and functional rehab. And you can access this through this link. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Gopalan will provide that in uh, the comments, uh, for, uh, the link for the first part. So the aim of this talk um, is for uh, how we deal uh, with a, uh, ACL deficient knee surgically. We'll talk about the indications, the controversies in management, um, graft choices, fixation methods, tunnel positioning. The tunnel positioning is critical. We have uh, been through various stages in reconstruction of ACL. And um, we have noticed that uh, the surgeon factors in positioning uh, the femoral tunnel is crucial. And that is one of uh, the main reasons of ACL failure. We'll briefly talk about double bundle reconstruction and ligament augmentations. We also talk about um, recent advances, including ACL repair, ALL reconstruction and ramp repair. Um, and we'll also touch upon special circumstances, especially in virus knees, what we do in hyperlax individuals and children. So uh, what are the indications for uh, surgically treating ACL um, injuries? The main symptom is instability. So after a functional rehab, uh, after ACL injury, isolated ACL injury, we will consider a surgical option. It is not for pain, it's for instability. So the patient will specifically say that while I'm doing certain things, my knee gives way, especially pivot, pivoting activity. A young person playing football can't go back to training is, 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 is basically the main indication. Uh, failure of ACL rehab um, is, is one of the key sometimes they progress through the functional rehab they go from level one to two to three and then they plateau uh, they can't reach the level four um, of the acl rehab and that's when they would come back to you and say look doctor you know i'm not progressing through acl rehabilitation and could you help me with this and you can then offer a acl reconstruction 
in especially younger adults and adolescents, um, we do a reconstruction to prevent any chondral injuries as well as uh, meniscal injuries. Because of the instability, um, there are various um, uh, research going on is whether secondarily this can affect um, the knee joint um, and cause chondral and meniscal injury, which is a, a interlinked thing. Even if you get a meniscal injury because of instability, you can then get chondral injury due to either the instability or because they have lost the cushion in the knee, the meniscal injury. And obviously in high elite sportsmen, inability to regain sporting activities because uh, footballers, uh, tennis players, they need to pivot on their knees. They need their ACL. And that's when we would consider straight away um, offering them surgical solutions. Um, so looking at various uh, options on surgical uh, management. So we have got two graft choices. One is allografts, uh, which is basically uh, from a cadaver, and autografts, which are our own uh, tissues. Um, that there are advantages and disadvantages of both. <clears throat> now, um, there was a Moon trial, which was a multicentric uh, cohort trial uh, based in America, wherein um, they found that during using allograft, especially in younger people increases the failure rate of ACL reconstruction. So my choice is to use autografts whenever possible. So when I get exhausted by the autografts, then that's when I look for allograft reconstruction, especially in multiple revisions of ACL or if a multi-ligamentous injury comes through. So there are various autographs. The most commonly used is the patella the tendon one and the hamstring grafts. Um, they are easily accessible. They are around the knees. There are pros and cons of either grafts. Uh, mainly, it depends on the surgical training. So if you were trained to use a hamstring graft or trained to use a patella tendon graft, that's what you would use normally. Um, there are various studies, various uh, uh, systematic reviews, as well as meta-analysis uh, in regards to the which is which one is better than the other and um, there has been no consensus so either one is good um, do what you do best and um, you know try and um, have as much collagen in your graft as much as possible um, one of the failure um, reasons uh, is is the graft thickness so if you're getting a very small graft it's better to uh, have more and more uh, tissue in it um, so if you are having a four strand quadruple um, hamstring graft, if, if, if it's quite thin in diameter, try and make it five strands or six strands to increase the bulk of the collagen and reduce the chances of failure in your ACL. Um, nowadays, there is quite little interest in quadriceps tendon grafts uh, where you can have a bone plug at one hand and um, uh, the tendon on the other, which has got quite a lot of collagen. It has got a good thick graft. And you could use that to reconstruct the ACL as well. And as I said, you know, the, the, there is very limited literature available for a quadriceps tendon graft. There has been interest in peroneus longus grafts as well, uh, which is uh, which has got very limited research um, studies done. But there are lots of graft choices. And uh, the bottom line is use what you know the best. The other controversy is what kind of fixation you're going to do um, for your ACL reconstruction. So uh, broadly classifying, they are either suspensory fixations, which are the loop. So you got a loop. This is the endo button and this is the tight rope. Both of them have got loops and um, both of them uh, holds uh, the ACL away from the fixation point. And that's the reason it's called a suspensory fixation. Um, the load to failure is quite great. So um, it, it is a very good fixation. The difference between these two loops is one of them is a fixed loop. So you can't have um, stretching or elongation of the loop. Whereas in, in, in uh, the other example, which is a tight rope, which is an adjustable loop. And there are pros and cons of each of them. Uh, there are various studies on either uh, of, of the options. And um, both the options are good. As I said, you know, do what you're, you're do the best and 
and what the techniques demand. So there are certain techniques which demands adjustable loop. Um, so that's when you will use it. Um, the other type of fixation is the interference screws, which is also called an aperture fixation. So which uh, helps to fix the graft into the tunnel itself. Um, and it gives better stability. The downside is it can damage the graft itself. Um, nowadays, we have got advancement in the screws itself. So you've got bioabsorbable screws, uh, which are also called as biocomposite screws. And the material that they use uh, stays there for about two years, which gives enough time for the tendon to uh, heal to the bone. Um, so this, this example has got aperture fixation on both the sides, whereas this example has got suspensory fixations on both the sides. The middle ground is you can have suspensory fixation on one side, most commonly the femoral side, and an interference screw or aperture fixation on the tibial side. So there are various options uh, that are available, and uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of each of them. Um, in my hands, um, I do a hybrid fixation with a suspensory fixation on the femur and a, um, aperture fixation on the tibia, but that's my personal preference. Tunnel positioning uh, is crucial, especially the femoral side. Now, we have gone through the anatomy in detail in the first part, and I will touch upon it a little bit. The femoral uh, anatomy of ACL insertion is, is broad. So initially in the, in, in the 90s, we went to a phase where we looked at the clock phase and determined which clock phase will uh, have our tunnel. So usually it was 11 o'clock uh, for some, 10 o'clock for some, uh, but each and every time we used to use the anterolateral viewing portal to determine what clock phase we were going to put our femoral tunnel in. And many of us used to do a transtibial approach uh, wherein we used to drill the femoral tunnel through the tibial tunnel. So that was called a transtibial femoral tunnel. Digit. And uh, that amounted to a vertical graft. So when you drill a femoral tunnel through the tibial tunnel, the, the, the direction of the graft was quite vertical. And what it did was it prevented um, the graft preventing the pivot shift. So because it was vertical, you could pivot across uh, along the graft and that led to um, not increased amount of failures, but reduction in for the patient to go back to the activity level or the functional level he was in before he had the, or she had the ACL injury. And hence, we then moved for an independent drilling of the femoral tunnel. So um, just a touch on the anatomy again. So uh, looking on the medial aspect, the lateral femoral condyle, you will see the lateral intercondylar ridge and the bifurcate ridge. You've got two different bundles of ACL and you know, you need to have a good coverage of, of here. You can only achieve that when you see this face and that can be done by a medial viewing portal. So that's the difference. And when you know where you're drilling the tunnel, it's, it's, um, it then makes sense. If you look at this picture, you can see uh, this is the medial viewing portal and you can, you have to understand that the anatomy is different because the knee is flex. So this part is the shallow portion. This part is the deeper portion. This is the posterior part, which is inferior. And that is the anterior part of, of the condyle. So you need to really understand the three-dimensional uh, viewing um, in, in regards to the positioning of the tunnel. That is the lateral intercondylar ridge and that's the bifurcate leash. And depending on what you're going to do, a single bundle or a double bundle, this is what you need to uh, see. And you need to get used to this view when you reconstruct the ACL. So going further, so um, this is again, the medial viewing portal. That's the footprint of the ACL. Now, when you do a transtibial tunnel, 
this is the position of the tunnel that you drill in. So it's quite superior. And that was the mistake. And that's the reason it, it does the patient didn't achieve the full outcome from ACL reconstructions. And uh, there was failure rates for that. So nowadays we have gone into a single bundle into the center of the footprint. Now, because we're visualizing from the medial side, a tunnel from a drilling uh, on, on the lateral femoral condyle through the medial portal, you will need two portals on the medial side if you're doing a medial portal drilling. Same for um, the two portal techniques, uh, two uh, bun double bundle technique, you need two bundles and two, two tunnels into the femur on the footprint itself. So now we will go to different techniques that we use. So these are the various techniques that we do. So that's the trans tibial femoral drilling. And you can see the direction of, of the drilling. And you can see it's so vertical when you drill it through the trans tibial technique. Whereas when you do an independent femoral tunnel through the medial portal, then it's quite in, at an angle. So you're viewing and drilling through the medial side. And um, it, it is technically challenging when you, when you do this. The third technique is, is a retro drilling. So you view from the medial side, but you drill it translateral, so through the femur itself. And that's, that's um, called retro drilling. So there is less crowding of instruments uh, in this technique. Now, um, if you look at that, the, the jig will sit at the point where the footprint is and the drill will go straight where the footprint is. And then you can drill a retro drilling uh, in whatever size tunnel that you want um, along, along this. Um, I think we should be able to have a video of, um, let me see if I can get to that. I hope this works. So this is uh, the retro drilling technique. So you're viewing from the medial portal. You're placing the jig at the footprint. And then you're drilling it from outside in. And that's one of the sleeves that goes into the lateral part of the bone. So there's no lateral blowout. You flip the drill and then you retro drill it. So you've got a tunnel. So there is no crowding of instruments uh, like we do for medial um, portal drilling. The other thing you need to have uh, for a medial portal drilling is hyperflexion, which again reduces the different, uh, the amount of space that is required. So you shuttle uh, the suture and then take the graft through both the tunnels and you fix it with a suspensory fixation at the top. And you can tension it at the top as well because it's an adjustable loop and then use an interference screw at the bottom. trying to move away from this now. Okay. So th these are the different type of fixations. So with this techniques, we have then developed how different modalities of fixation. So uh, as I said before, you can have um, suspensive fixation on both the sides. Now, the advantage of this is you can do a all inside technique. So you don't have to drill all the way through the bone uh, to fix it. And it's a good armament, armamentarium to have um, because you can use a four strand 
uh, four um, strand uh, semi tendinosis, which has got a, will give you a very thick graft, and uh, you can then position uh, the tunnels wherever you want to. Especially true in children, because if you want to go for extra physial uh, fixation or um, epiphyseal fixation, you can direct the tunnels wherever you want to. Um, the various other techniques that we have is, you know, these are the apertures, this is the hybrid fixation, so suspensory fixation at the top and uh, apertures fixation bottom. This is most commonly uh, used kind of technique uh, in UK. And uh, this is for a bilat, uh, you know, both the sides, you can have uh, aperture fixation um, with bioabsorbable screws or uh, biocomposite screws. Now, looking at the tibial footprint, um, the tibial footprint has to be correct as well. So uh, going anterior on the tibial footprint is going to cause limited extension and going to posterior on the tibial footprint will lead to uh, reduced flexion. So the tightness of the joint will differ depending on where you put your tibial tunnel. So it's very crucial that you put the tibial tunnel where it should. And that's the reason it's better to leave some of the ACL remnant so that you know exactly where you're going uh, through your tibia. A good landmark is the lateral meniscus. So the post, the margin of uh, the posterior margin of the anterior horn should point at, at the level of uh, your tunnel. The other thing about a tunnel uh, positioning is it can impinge the notch if the notch is too narrow. So you have to be careful where you position your tibial tunnel as well. So if you look at the diagram, um, you got the medial tibial spine. That's the lateral side. And if you see the lateral meniscus anterior horn, it's at the level of, of that. And it's a good landmark to know where uh, to position your tibial uh, tunnel. Two medial and two lateral can also damage uh, the horns of the meniscus and you have to be careful with that. That's another picture and you can see um, the, anti, uh, the uh, lateral meniscal anterior horn goes into the insertion of the ACL as, as we saw in the previous lecture, it encapsulates the anterior uh, horn of the lateral meniscus. Uh, so you need to be a bit careful about that. A medial tibial spine is, is quite a good landmark as well. So, you know, all these landmarks help you to decide where you are going to position your tibial tunnel. Uh, we'll just touch upon a single bundle and double bundle technique. Um, the only difference is... Uh, in the double bundle, you've got two bundles. So you separately reconstruct the uh, AL um, and the uh, AM and the uh, PL bundle uh, with two different tunnels and fix it with two different fixation methods. Um, it's a recognized technique. Uh, so far, there is no um, literature saying one technique is better than the other. Um, clinically, so the cl clinical studies for double bundle uh, reconstruction hasn't proven to be better than a single bundle reconstruction. So um, most of the surgeons in the UK would uh, prefer a single bundle technique. And uh, a little bit touch on ACL augmentation. So you can augment the ACL using um, a suture or a tape as well. So if you have a ACL um, bundle, especially in younger people, which uh, is less than 7.5 in diameter, you can augment it with what we call as a suture tape um, or, um, or a suture material, which is thick enough and has got good um, pull-out strength uh, to, to fix it. Um, so it helps to hold the graft in place till it heals. And once it heals, then the graft should uh, take over the fixation um, or the augmentation material. So there are various materials um, available for augmentation as well. 
especially if you are looking at ACL repair techniques, augmentation is quite helpful. Um, so uh, the recent trend is for ACL preservation. Um, just go through um, some repair techniques. So <clears throat> you can see ACL can be repaired, especially in younger people who has got potential to heal. There are various types of ACL tears, um, and the one that we tend uh, to go for repair, especially in younger people, is when they are peeled off from the lateral femoral condyle. So if there is a small flake of bone from the lateral femoral condyle, or if it's just like a peel uh, from the lateral femoral condyle in children, you can repair it. At the same time, when you repair it, you can augment it with, with the suture tape as well. And it, it gives an environment for the ACL to heal. And there are recent studies that it does work. You can also use anchors to fix uh, the ACL back. And um, there, especially in uh, the French literature, has gone uh, quite um, advanced in relation to ACL repair. We do have a registry where um, we are now taking data about ACL repair. And um, hopefully soon uh, there will be good research into whether this is a good technique uh, to offer to our patients. Um, we have to be cognizant about a ramp lesion. Uh, so the ramp lesion is a menisco capsular lesion over the medial side of, um, of the knee. And this is, this is present in about 50 to 70% of the people who have got ACL tear. So you have to look for it. Um, recent studies have shown that the ramp lesion uh, has got crucial role in uh, stability of the knee. And just repairing this lesion increases the stability of the knee along with ACL reconstruction. So be aware of that. If you see a ramp lesion, um, try and see if you can fix it. So that's the capsule. That's the medial meniscus. And you can see there is a separation of the meniscus from the capsule. And that is what we call as a ramp lesion. And uh, it, ha it is at the healing zone of the meniscus, so you can repair it and heals really well. And last but not the least, we'll talk about uh, AL reconstruction. We went through the anatomy uh, in the last lecture. So it's an antilateral structure and is injured uh, during ACL injuries, especially in pivoting injury. And reconstructing the ALL um, can uh, offer more stability. There are various techniques to reconstruct the ALL. Um, in in a uh, long time ago, we used to do extra articular tenodesis for our ACL reconstructions, which was commonly called the Macintosh technique, where we used to take a band of um, a slip of the iliotibial band and then loop it around um, the insertion of the adductum magnus and uh, sorry the, the lateral um, uh, bony prominence and loop it around and stitch it to itself so um, similar kind of techniques have been developed um, the most commonly used is the modified lamer technique wherein you take a, a strip of um, the iliotibial pan and fix it uh, on the femur either through a suspensory or an interference screw or you can even use anchor or a staple uh, to fix it So we've been through this. And then we will talk about special situations, um, especially in virus knees. So many footballers do have virus knees. It does give them a technical advantage to play football. Um, but we have to be cognizant that um, the virus knee does increase the load on the ACL itself. And um, if there is significant virus, we need to correct the virus along with the ACL reconstruction or the ACL will fail. And hence, um, we can, what we tend to offer is um, a combined procedure where we do a high table osteotomy to correct the virus deformity of the knee. And along with it, we, we uh, reconstruct the ACL. 
uh, there is technical challenges for this, especially the anterior screw of the high tibial osteotomy plate always comes near the tibial tunnel and a uh, variable angle locking plate is very useful where you can direct the screws around the tunnel to prevent any tunnel encroachment. Um, so uh, there are various techniques described for that. Various plates are available uh, to achieve this goal. We have to be cognizant about hyperlax individuals. So uh, in people with hypermobility syndrome, or if they are very hyperlax, um, then ACL reconstruction might not give enough stability to their knees. And um, in, in my practice, I augment it um, as well as, you know, um, do a ALL reconstruction to prevent them from uh, failure. So uh, that's something uh, for food of thought. I don't think there is enough literature to support this, but um, certainly it does help. In children, uh, you have to think a bit laterally. There are various techniques available. The first technique uh, that we have is um, physial sparing ACL reconstructions. The physial sparing ACL reconstructions um, are the workhorse in very young children, um, especially when they're, they're less than 10. Um, we do have a grading system uh, to uh, to help us determine which kind of uh, reconstruction that we do for children. It's called the Tanner's uh, grading. And um, for the lower Tanner grading, we tend to go for physical sparing reconstruction. Um, this is a hybrid um, fixation where you go uh, physical sparing on the femoral side because the femoral uh, epiphysis um, or the physis has got more tendency to cause um, damage and deformity whereas on the tibial side because the tunnel is more centrally located it doesn't cause much or more of a deformity uh, in in tanner two or threes and uh, that's when we tend to go for um, a transphysial on the tibial side and the physical sparing on the femoral side in adolescence um, you know um, where the growth plate is present but they have uh, reached uh, puberty and they're tinus four then we tend to do for transphysial fixations on both the sides and that has um, not shown in literature to cause much deformities so um, just a food for thoughts also in children always go for autographs um, not allografts because there's a very high failure rate uh, in younger people with allografts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yogesh, for yet another fantastic lecture. A uh, couple of questions. With regards to suspensory versus an interference or an aperture fixation, do you think that the suspensory has an advantage? For example, in case it goes for a revision, the bone is more preserved in a suspensory. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, when you're thinking about revision surgeries, you know, especially on the femoral side, if you're using aperture fixation, then taking that screw out is a nightmare. Um, so uh, that's the reason I use suspensory on the femur side, because um, when you're thinking about revision scenarios, uh, dealing with a suspensory fixation is, is so easy. You know, you, you, it, it is very advantageous when you look uh, at that model, especially if you are um, in, in a referral center where you get uh, fail, failed ACLs um, and, and then you try and realize, oh, you know, this, this is probably what I wouldn't do. And uh, Yogesh, do you think that the technical aspect is slightly more challenging with the suspensory? Because there have been some reports of persistent graph laxity when you compare it with an interference fixation. Yeah, so, uh, the, 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 yes, so you're correct. With certain uh, companies, especially, yeah. Especially if you are uh, using um, adjustable loop. Um, there are various, there are different types of adjustable loops as well. So some of the adjustable loops, uh, you have got friction on the button and that can cause failure of the, uh, the knot. 
as to say, and that can lead to a bit of laxity. There have been studies, uh, you know, looking at different kind of suspensory fixation. The fixed loop as well uh, is, you know, it doesn't stretch out because it, it's fixed. Uh, whereas the adjustable loops, there are certain uh, loops that have failed uh, the fixation mode. The, the technique is the key. So if you are doing a suspensory fixation, when you have tightened your adjustable loop, you then reinforce that with another knot on the top. So you can have a sliding knot on the top so that it doesn't slide again. So there are techniques to prevent uh, the laxity. So yes, so you have to be aware which, and there are so many companies who make this now. So you just follow what, what um, you know, the technique that they have been described and always look into the literature. So the, the product that you're using needs to stand the test of time. So if you feel that the product that you're using has got high failure rates, then obviously you need to change the product. And um, there are certain um, adjustable loop, the newer ones, which does not have any friction. So they're like a hammock and they just pull the whole graph towards you rather than you know uh, the oscillating movements, the toggling that we do uh, during the suspensory fixation. So there, there are workarounds to that. So the technology has improved significantly and that uh, initial uh, laxity has been negated with, with, with the different techniques that we do. So in that case, an aperture fixation would be more forgiving, but the problems with an aperture was, is bone loss and revision is going to be difficult, right? So both has pros and cons, isn't it? Well, the, the aperture fixations have improved as well. In the technology for aperture fixation now incorporates bioabsorbable material and everything to to help us, um, you know, to if we are going to revise and if if the aperture fixation has resolved, then you don't get that problem. Uh, the issue about tunnel widening, I didn't talk about it. So um, there there is an issue of tunnel widening with suspensory fixation than uh, aperture fixation. But various studies have shown that it doesn't uh, affect uh, individual functionally. So even if there is a tunnel widening, then it, it doesn't cause the function. The problem is uh, if there is a bioabsorbable material in the tunnel and it, it creates a, a body reaction and forms a cyst, uh, and, and there is this tunnels that can have a cystic nature, um, when you go in for revisions, that's when difficulty arises. And that's when you think about two-stage revisions uh, for ACL. Thank you, Yogesh, for that. And you mentioned about ramp. Now, there's a lot of emphasis on ramp repair, meniscal root repair. So what are, what are the ways how you repair a ramp generally? Yeah, so uh, ramp lesion is a meniscocapsular lesion. So... Um, you know, if it was a meniscal tear, you can repair it all inside. You can put anchors in, in the meniscus. You have to really look into what kind of tear it is. So there are different types of uh, ramp lesion. There is a classification of ramp lesion as well. So if it's just a meniscal capsular lesion, then you have to repeat it. Uh, you can't do all inside technique. Uh, you have to have a postromedial portal. And just like a sh shoulder surgeon uses... Um, um, it, uh, to fix the um, uh, labral tear, you just fix it similarly. So you take a couple of sutures between uh, one holding the meniscus and one into the capsule and just tie it together. And that causes the bump, you know, with the labral lesions, you create a bump so that the humeral head doesn't dislocate. Similarly, uh, you create a kind of a bump uh, on the post postromedial aspect of, of the knee uh, and that helps in preventing the pivot uh, that, that happens and it heals really quickly. So, uh, you know, once you have one or two sutures, it, it heals within six weeks time and uh, it, it helps in regaining more stability. It's just an armamentarium that you need to know. So if there is a ramp lesion, you can uh, fix that. Uh, Antilateral reconstruction is another armamentarium that you can have. So if you're reconstructing an ACL and you then find, oh, there is still a residual pivot, which I don't like, you have got this armamentarium to, to enhance the fixation that you do. And Yogesh, the, are these ramp usually located posteromedially or postlaterally? And postlaterally, you may need to have another portal. How is it? 
when you deal with the postlateral side i haven't seen a postlateral ramp it's always it's always always on the medial side i haven't seen it yet but there have been descriptions of ramp lesions postlaterally uh, especially the root avulsions laterally so a posterior root avulsions are more common laterally than a ramp lesions uh, so ramp lesions are mainly posteromedially uh, whereas if there are root avulsions uh, then they are more located over the lateral side thank you yogesh for that just one last question before we wind up the session what do you see a take on tibial slope versus an acl failure for example excessive slope or a reversal of slope do you go for a slope changing or a slope reversing osteotomy before doing an acl reconstruction in those predisposing ones yes uh, so i i didn't touch that topic in the i just stuck touch on the varus uh, which is a coronal deformity so the sagittal deformities does uh, cause issues with acl reconstruction especially in hyperlax individuals so you have to look at the tibial slope in hyperlax individuals or with patients with uh, with you know conditions like um, congenital conditions which can cause some morphological changes into the proximal tibia and they will have various other associated factors like Uh, tibial torsions, femoral torsions, and all all that um, gamut, which as as you know, you know, it's like a syndrome uh, it, in itself, and that's when you look at uh, start to look at the slope and uh, various things in failed ACLs. Uh, so if if there is a ACL failure that comes to me, then obviously you look into coronal and sagittal alignment, and then. then as a cause or if you want to pinpoint a cause to that failure then you can say okay that increased slope has caused this failure of acl reconstruction and hence you can do a slope changing osteotomy uh, rather than doing a revision acl reconstruction obviously if you look at uh, the veterinary medicine uh, 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 dogs with acl uh, deficient knees a uh, high tibial osteotomy is the solution for that because that that prevents instability so you know hdo has got a crucial role um, in in uh, preventing instability especially the anterior lateral instability um, but it it has to be a measured uh, way of looking so if there is a dysplastic proximal tibia yes you will look at the tibial slope and then decide to correct the slope for for the patient but in routine i i really don't uh, look into that uh, yes you look at the coronal alignment um and if you're correcting it with the hto uh, as in a combined case with hto and acl reconstruction you may then look into the lateral view have a look at the slope and then correct it at the same time thank you yogesh for that i think that's all the questions that we have for the session thank you for yet another fantastic lecture from your side i'm sure this is going to reach even more to huge audience all over the world thank you so much yogesh thank you so much doc